know, the earth that we stand on feels solid, but it really isn't. It's all moving, and they call those things tectonic plates. And you've probably never heard of something called Gondwana, but in the distant past, that was the land mass that included most of today's southern hemisphere. And Gondwana broke apart, and a piece of it traveled through the uh, magma and whatever's underlying our, our, our tectonic plates. It traveled north until it came in touch with the Asian subcontinent, and then it crashed. And when it crashed, it formed the Himalaya chain, and those mountains are still going up, and that plate is still moving. And this earthquake that took place in Nepal was the equivalent of 20 nuclear bombs. See, there's the Eurasian plate, the African plate, the Indian plate. But India was a separate uh, unit, and it moved up from Africa up that way and, and collided with that Eurasian plate or the uh, Asian plate and smashed up to those mountains. And so the Himalayas have had uh, terrible uh, landslides. Why? Because they are still growing. And the death toll is pretty substantial. Terry will tell us about it. Well, it is. It's now close to 4,000 people, and it's expected to go far higher. Dale Hurd brings us the story. As the death toll keeps climbing by the hour, Officials still aren't sure what happened to the small villages at the epicenter of Nepal's massive quake. Landslides are hindering access, and experts say often in cases like this, entire villages can be swallowed by falling rock. Meanwhile, aftershocks continue. The earth is, is really moving now, as you can see, everyone's running through the streets. Saturday's quake spread horror from Kathmandu to Mount Everest and triggered an avalanche that buried part of a base camp packed with foreign climbers. The ground is shaking. Scientists say the Nepal quake had the force of 20 thermonuclear bombs, that major quakes occur in the area about every 80 years. The last major quake was 81 years ago, and the area is at the convergence of two huge tectonic plates. The rescue effort is ongoing. Workers pulled this man through the window of a collapsed building as bystanders applauded. This young girl was also pulled to safety. Most of them are suffering from head injuries. Food, water and power remain scarce. One expert said the cost of long-term reconstruction in Nepal could be more than $5 billion. That's about 20 percent of Nepal's gross domestic product. That means massive international financial and technical assistance will be vital for long-term reconstruction. The government of Nepal has appealed for more help from the international community, saying Nepal was short of everything from paramedics to electricity. CBN Disaster Relief is already working to provide food and shelter as well as sending a full medical team to help. Priti Chowdhury is CBN's regional director for India really want to pray that the love of Jesus Christ can, and the hope in him can reach these people. And uh, we just want to be able to do that. At, I, we want to be able to share the love of God uh, with these people right now. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. And CBN International and Operation Blessing are on the scene. And the number you can call to participate, let's help these people. Uh, I know it's an earthquake and it's tectonic plates and all the rest of it, but still people suffer. So it's 1-800-759-0700, and you can participate with just a, a small amount of money. You know, there's so much, Pat, that happens that we don't oh, realize yeah. in that. Orphan's Promise supports a pretty decent orphanage there. In the pool destroyed. All the children have had to be taken out. We have a lot of work with children up in the mm -hmm. mountains that are disabled, and so there's a great need there right it's now. It's so poor to start with, and then a devastating yes. uh, quake like this. But this happens, they say, every uh, 80 years or so. Yeah. It's, it's an unusual mm -hmm. thing, but it was devastating. They're finally speaking out about the President of the United States. And here at home, former President George Bush has had some strong words for President Obama in relation to his attitude toward the Middle East. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. 
Thanks, Pat. Former President Bush, as you said, criticized President Obama on Iran and the war against ISIS. Bloomberg News reports the former President Bush made those remarks in a closed-door meeting with Jewish donors over the weekend. Bush told the audience that Mr. Obama was putting the U.S. in retreat around the world and that he thought the nuclear deal with Iran would be bad for American security over the long term and that it would make the Middle East even more chaotic. He also said Obama is losing the war with ISIS and remarked when you say something as president, you have to mean it. Well, the CEO of the Clinton Foundation is admitting they made mistakes disclosing donor information. This as Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign is coming under scrutiny for donations made to the Clinton Foundation when she was Secretary of State. The Clinton Foundation is now planning to refile some tax forms to remedy those disclosure errors. What's important to note is it was confirmed on Thursday, both by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, that there are multi-million dollar non-disclosed donations that were made to the Clinton Foundation that were never disclosed by the Clintons. This is a direct breach of an agreement they signed with the White House. That Author Peter Schweitzer says the Clinton camp may call those coincidences. He says it looks more like evidence of a trend. Schweitzer will appear this Thursday on The 700 Club. Faith took center stage for many of the 2016 presidential candidates this weekend in Iowa who took part in a Faith and Freedom Forum, hoping to draw evangelicals to support their campaigns. David Brody was there and brings us this story from Des Moines. This Iowa mega church provided a mega dose of scripture and campaign promises as presidential candidates took the pulpit looking to sway an evangelical congregation. Whether it was Rand Paul defending the pro-life position. I'm tired of us retreating on this issue and I'm going to push back. Or Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal pushing hard on religious liberty. The United States of America did not create religious liberty. Religious liberty created the United States of America and is the reason we're here today. Evangelicals play a critical role in the state of Iowa. Four years ago, Rick Santorum won this state. And four years before that, it was Mike Huckabee. Both gentlemen appear ready to go again, but this time the field is going to be much wider and deeper. There could be more than 10 candidates, and so far, Christian voters seem torn. Ted Cruz is the real deal. He is a solid Christian, 100% knows God. I think Governor Mike Huckabee stood out, and he, he has for some time. So he would definitely be my f first choice, without question. Ted Cruz tells CBN News that winning this crowd means everything. If you can win mm -hmm. a good majority of evangelicals, then what happens to your candidacy? I think evangelicals, Christians, people of faith are going to play the decisive role in the Republican primary. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to play the decisive role in the general election in 2016. And Cruz is just one of many competing here. Please help me welcome Senator Marco Rubio. As Marco Rubio rises in the polls, he's filling up local Iowa House parties, reassuring voters that he sees no constitutional right to gay marriage, something the Supreme Court takes up this week. Where are you on this whole idea of a constitutional right that many people think? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There is no federal constitutional right to same-sex marriage. That's what they're going to argue. And, and there isn't such a right. It, it, no, you would have to really have a ridiculous and absurd reading of the U.S. Constitution to reach the conclusion that people have a right to marry someone of the same sex. There is no such constitutional right. Fighting to protect traditional marriage will be just one of many issues these candidates address head on here in Iowa and beyond. David Brody, CBN News, near Des Moines, Iowa. Thanks, David. And you can see more of David Brody's interviews at The Brody File on CBNNews.com. Well, a judge in Oregon is proposing the owners of a bakery pay $135,000 to a lesbian couple for refusing to bake a wedding cake for them more than two years ago. Aaron and Melissa Klein, the owners of Sweet Cakes by Melissa, say they would not bake the cake because of their religious beliefs. But the judge says they should pay damages for the couple's emotional suffering. Both sides will review the proposal and have the opportunity to file exceptions before Oregon's labor commissioner issues a final order. Pat, back to you. This is an absolute outrage. Ladies and gentlemen, in that city, there were a number of bakers more than delighted to build a, uh, make a wedding cake for the gay couple. 
But what did they do? They picked the one couple who were a Christian who didn't want to go along. And then they sued. And to say they had emotional damage is nonsense because it was a contrived setup in order to gain points against Christianity. And for a judge to go along with that, it makes you want to vomit. That's the kind of mess we've got on the courts, and those judges should be uh, uh, taken off the court. It's just outrageous. But as Marco Rubio said, well, uh, there is no uh, constitutional mandate dealing with same-sex marriage. It's just not there. And it's a religious ceremony presided over by the church. It was considered a sa one of the sacraments of the, the Christian church. And if they want to have same-sex unions, that's a civil matter. They are more than delighted. But to force somebody to perform a part of a wedding against their religious be beliefs is an outrage. And you wonder about what is a judge is thinking. But it's time we stand up against this. This is tyranny of the left. Tyranny, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I want to pat us on the back just a little bit. You've been watching this program for many years, possibly. You probably haven't been watching it for 30. But 30 years ago, yours truly, Debbie Whitson and other members of our staff, but I, I began to understand the dangers of something called NutraSweet, what a devastating effect it had on people in relation to their health, their, their physical um, demeanor, their mental acuity, their, their eyesight, all kinds of things, terrible. And yet uh, it was embraced, and a man named Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense, worked for G.D. Searle, and Searle was the big company that at that point of time owned the rights to this uh, sweetener. Well, after 30 years, the guys at Pepsi have finally got it right. They said, we're not going to put any longer put aspartame in our diet drink. Congratulations to Pepsi. You're the real deal. John. That is right, Pat. Pepsi is dropping aspartame, popularly known as NutraSweet, from Diet Pepsi. The move comes in response to customer feedback. Pepsi is replacing aspartame with another artificial sweetener, sucralose, commonly known as Splenda. The change comes as Americans have been turning away from diet sodas. Executives at both Coke and Pepsi blame the declines in sales on public perception that aspartame is not safe, even though the FDA says it's one of the most exhaustively studied substances in the food supply. Pepsi says the change will affect all types of diet Pepsi, like wild cherry and caffeine-free. They will start hitting the shelves in August, but Pat, only here in the United States. Well, you'd hope to do it around the world, but uh, sooner or later people will wake up. But you know, the funny thing about uh, this other thing, uh, Splenda, <clears throat> how do you get Splenda? Well, you take sugar and um, uh, you treat it with chemicals and uh, the product is, is Splenda. So it is a type of sugar with, uh, um, uh, well... Uh, so have we made any health gains in this? <laughs> probably not, probably not. The, the, the one that really is, is the, the good one is... is um, from a natural substance that uh, I, I think is very effective. But anyhow, uh, they're all chemicals and they don't do you much good, but I tell you, uh, uh, the uh, substance that is being taken out of Pepsi's really leads to serious, serious, dangerous consequences. So if Coke doesn't follow suit, don't drink Cokes. <laughs>